everybody. I'm excited to be with you right now, and um, I have some important information. It's teacher keynote or time, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you and get started. So this year, um, first of all, for anybody that is new, um, Teacher Keynoter is a tried and true tradition. Um, it was started back in 1996 by Sam Stort and Willis Spicer, former superintendent and assistant superintendent. And the first one was, it used to be called the Stort Spicer Teacher Keynoter Award. And um, usually in the fall is when we have it and it's a district tradition. tradition and honors our faculty. And for um, now in our, our 24th year, um, we are celebrating teachers. And usually we select uh, one teacher to present the keynote speech. And this teacher is an honoree and distinguished master teacher. And it's great, we hear their story. And um, it's, it's called this um, because of um, the message that Sam Stewart and Willis Spice are always inspired in our teachers. And um, it's it's been part of who we are, the makeup of our traditions of South Brunswick. And we have um, a tradition of many years of this. And I share with you, let me move forward in the presentation. I share with you all of the folks that have been teacher keynoters in the past. Um, you can see names um, going back of people that are still here and people that might be long retired. Like I said, it started back in 1996. You can see the names here from 1996 until um, 2009 and um, changed a little bit in 2009 where we had um, multiple teachers at each level. And um, we did that again another year in 2010 as well. Um, but we always come together as a family and get to celebrate and hear the story. Um, just last year, it was um, Gary Yepes from Crossroads South and he shared his awesome story with us. Um, and so um, in talking about this year and this craziness of this year, I, I went to our admin and I asked them, do we do it again? And um, so I got feedback and I just wanted to share you some of these quotes from our, our, our administrators. It was, yes, I love this tradition. And others said, I do think we should have a teacher keynote. It's a South Brunswick tradition and should not be dependent on the pandemic. It's always important to sit in and hear the stories of others for reflection and inspiration. Somebody else said, yes, I think we should. So much has been given up and lost over the last year. We should do our best to preserve the tradition um, that, we, that we are able to rethink for the times. So they want us to have it, but maybe change it. And finally, yes, I believe it might be important to continue the tradition if possible. I know it might look different, but it might be nice to continue and we agree. And so here we are in a different kind of format celebrating our teacher keynoter. And so we do keep this tradition. And even with the craziness of COVID happening, um, we can have this tradition. And I'm calling it this one this year. Pivot has been a big word for me. And it always makes me think of friends. So in honor of friends, I'm calling this Teacher Keynoter 2020, the one where COVID happened. And so we're here to celebrate and um, excited to share some things with you. So basically, um, from the start of the pandemic back in March, we've all been challenged with so many barriers and worries, and um, they've really challenged every aspect of our work in our daily life. And there, there have been like three main areas, I would say, that have been most challenging for us and a need for us to be creative and to pivot. And these are something that we've been talking a lot about, health and safety, our mental wellness, and remote teaching, what that's gonna look like. Um, I can tell you though, in true SB fashion, you all took this head on and have been embracing um, our district theme this year to really find the silver lining. And, and that's what it's really all about today. We're celebrating the silver, silver lining and, and finding good in all of this. Um, our teacher keynoters, I say teacher keynoters with an S there, so more surprises to come, have really followed the mantra of this quote. Um, they have seen the good in, the situ in, in this situation and have made lemonade out of lemons. They've truly found the silver lining, um, even in a situation like COVID. Um, so I'm proud to present that we have not one, not two, but six 
teacher keynoters this year to represent all of those areas that I just mentioned. Um, there's so many different aspects to this pandemic world. And so a little different than past keynoters, these folks are gonna share with us their story, their journey this year, and how they embraced and found the silver linings in um, you know, the perspective of their job in the COVID world. So um, the, the keynoters I'm about to announce they're going to tell you stories about how they reinvented themselves um, or their program, causing a huge pivot to their thinking. Um, they might share with you how they've used their expertise in a different way during this time. Some of our keynoters are going to share how they made the most of it and found those silver linings. Um, and some are going to hear their personal story and how it pushed them how to make the most out of the situation. Um, we think you're going to find yourself in these stories. Um, they're a representation of all of us. And um, this group is a representation of all of us. And it's really meant to inspire um, and have, have us celebrate the good that's come out of such a tricky situation. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our 2020 teacher keynoters. Um, we have them grouped in the categories that I mentioned earlier. Um, so for health and safety, we celebrate Yvonne Smogard um, from Constable School. She's a nurse and she's going to talk to us and so excited for her. Under mel mental wellness, um, we actually have two teacher keynoters listed here. Both are behaviorists for the district and it's Dr. Brian Eichert and Dr. Rebecca High. They're going to share their journey with you from their perspective of mental wellness world. And finally, our category of remote teaching, I'm excited um, to congratulate and, and share with you. We have three teacher keynoters and um, they're gonna share their experiences and their stories are just as inspiring. Representing the elementary world is one Patty Del Gercio from Indian Field School. Um, Trisha Metzger from Crossroads North is going to share her middle school perspective. And finally, rounding out this trio, we have Meryl Orlando from the high school, who's going to inspire us and share about her program and how COVID has impacted her world. We're so happy and excited for these six staff members, and we know that you will be um, able to truly connect with their stories. Um, this is monumental and it's different this year, and um, what a deserved group to be our keynoters this year. So I, I want to say a big round of applause for them right now. A pause so you can clap. Um, and uh, so I'm going to start the introductions and um, let you be able to listen to each of our inspiring folks that you see on this screen. So first up, under mental wellness, don't you love that picture? Cracks me up. We, I think the pandem pandemic has aged her. I'm only kidding. This is from when she was two. So first up, um, we have Yvonne um, Smogard. She's a nurse at Constable School, and she joined the district in 2014. In addition to her nurse duties, this year she's currently serving alongside Jim Conroy as part of the COVID Central team. She truly is working 24-7 to keep up to keep us all safe. Um, so please, in your classrooms or in your home, wherever you're watching, please give a warm welcome and congratulations to Yvonne. Yvonne, I pass it to you. My name is Yvonne Smogard. I am the Constable Elementary School nurse. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for the honor to be a keynote speaker. I'm here because I am the face behind COVID Central. So let me tell you a little bit about me, how autonomy, determination, and advocating for the health and safety of our schools has brought me here today. I'm a Boston University graduate. My major was nursing, my minor in education. My nursing career began in Boston at Brigham and Women's Hospital. It was an amazing place to work. When I moved to New Jersey, I worked at St. Barnabas Medical Center on their kidney transplant floor and in the critical care units. Working in intensive care, I worked with the doctors and advocated for my patients' needs, both spoken and often unspoken. After 14 years in ICU, I left critical care and I found my happy place in school nursing. I have to tell you, when people ask me, what do I do? I tell them, 
I have the best job in the world. I am a school nurse. Now, in this world of COVID, I had to ask myself as the school nurse, how do I advocate for my staff? How do I support my students, my constable family? How do I protect them from COVID? How do I keep them healthy? We are all teachers in some way, as educators, as parents, as administrators, as staff, we all teach. I know many of you have asked the same questions about our students during this time, and that is, how can I help? My journey to help began reading The Road Back. Within it, I found the New Jersey Department of Health COVID-19 public health recommendations for local health departments and K-12 schools. Reading a 17-page document with a 17-word title, I fell into the abyss of state guidelines. I sat down and sorted through the document. I created flowcharts, some flowcharts that have been shared with many of the schools in Middlesex County. I highlighted, footnoted, and placed post-its along the edges to locate details. I followed all the links to the CDC, compared all of the health regulations, read the New Jersey Department of Ed COVID FERPA regulations. I was ready. I had the answers. All I had to do was find someone to ask me the questions. I had the opportunity to sit down with safety and compliance officer James Conroy. And when I did, COVID Central essentially began. Together we discussed the best course of action to implement the New Jersey Department of Health guidelines. We worked side by side to interpret regulations for the different COVID-19 activity levels. Using my flow sheets, we developed guidelines for the South Brunswick School District to address sick students and staff, along with contact tracing within our schools. We designed guidelines to implement cleaning procedures that had been established by buildings and grounds. We developed procedures to be in compliance with the state guidelines for reporting of ill students and staff as directed by state and county health departments. South Brunswick School District supported me when I advocated for the best and healthiest environment for our staff and students. COVID Central was created as a resource for staff in addition to being the central location to coordinate the continuity of COVID guidelines throughout the district. This was possible because Superintendent Scott Fetter made it possible. COVID Central is here to advocate for the staff and the students to make the process of dealing with COVID easier and seamless. When you are ill or know someone who is, your anxiety level can paralyze you. As teachers, you see this every day in your students when they don't understand a math formula, maybe when they're learning to read or struggling with a chemistry lesson. As teachers, we help in the same way. We take control. We remind them we're here for them. We educate them. We all have the answers. Sometimes, we need to help teach others to ask the questions. With the coordination of human resources, the cooperation of principals, special services, transportation, tech, and countless others, we are able to facilitate the paperwork, support our staff, and care for our students. COVID Central has worked with every nurse in this district to coordinate the implementation of the ever-changing and endless state guidelines. Our South Brunswick nurses are now at the heart of the process for coordinating the COVID concerns of our students. Each of our school nurses has the knowledge, the compassion, and now the tools to address all of the COVID concerns of their students. The best compliment you can give them for all of their work is to say, I'm glad you're here. Reach out to the nurses via email, leave them a note, yell to them down the hallways, say it out loud, I'm glad you're here. COVID Central is here as a resource 
for staff and administration. We have the answers. Come ask us the questions. Can you travel? I can help you with guidelines for that. Are you a contact? I can help you sort through the guidelines for that. Do you have COVID symptoms? I will help you coordinate and simplify the next steps. Who needs a temperature check? I can help you with the guidelines for that. Do you need to complete a health screening every morning? Yes, and I can tell you why. Since October, I have personally spoken to over 270 staff members. I have answered 1,100 emails. We have worked with all departments within the district, with educators, staff, administrators, and paras. With regards to all things COVID, we are here for you. Last year, on April 5th, 2020, my father passed away from complications of COVID-19. I am one of five children and not one of us was allowed to be with him in the hospital. But my father did not die alone. He had a nurse by his side. I'm glad she was there. It is my obligation to do whatever I need to do to protect my students, my South Brunswick family. Together, we can create the healthiest environment in our school. Let me take a moment to recognize James Conroy, who was receptive to all of my answers, even though I'm not sure I gave him the opportunity to ask any questions. Thank you, South Brunswick. I'm glad I'm here with you. Stay healthy. A big congratulations to Eve. Um, next up under the umbrella of mental wellness is, um, let me pull up my screen. As I mentioned before, it's Brian Eichert. And so excited to have Brian speak to us. And um, uh, you can find Brian working with students and teachers throughout our elementary schools. He's joined our um, team in 2018 and has made such a marked difference in, in our world since. Um, Brian is um, a huge part of our SEL and leading our SEL district team and initiatives there. And most recently, um, Brian was presenting a parent academy um, during this COVID time to families around SEL. So please let's give a congratulations and um, listen carefully to Brian's story. Brian, I turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Jen, for the introduction. To say that I am humbled to be one of the people asked to speak today is a gross understatement. In fact, for those of you who know me, I typically always have something to say and never shy away from an opportunity to speak my mind. But truth be told, when I was made aware of this honor, I was completely speechless. There are many times I can crawl when that's been the case. Anyway, I am deeply grateful for the privilege to speak to you all today and bear with me as I try to do this without a chance to read the room or gauge your responses and work to navigate a variety of different technologies all at once. I wanted to start with a quote that has acted as a personal guide for me throughout this pandemic. Dr. Nancy Boyd Franklin, a psychologist and professor at the Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology at Rutgers, once said, hope is in the struggle. This quote can be interpreted in many ways, but here's what it means to me. No part about this pandemic has been without struggle. Waking up a few minutes later and rolling into the home office seemed great at first, but was then met with the struggle of blending work life and home life, a boundary so many of us work hard to maintain. Having some peace and quiet in between classes and meetings seemed great at first, but quickly became isolating and lonely. Consultation with colleagues, which usually was a simple chat in the hall or a call on the school phones, was turning into scheduled talk time at lengthy email chains, text conversations, coordinating schedules. And on top of all of this, each of us on a personal level was dealing with the sobering familial and personal aspects and effects of the pandemic. 
While I'm sure my experience during this pandemic has been different than most, I have been personally affected by the impacts of COVID-19, and I would assume many of you have as well. To all of you, I want you to know that you are not alone. This virus has struck so many of us in so many different ways. It's real, it's tough, it's scary, but what you are experiencing is shared by many. Hope is in the struggle. Sometimes we just need to open our eyes a little bit wider to see it. And this is exactly what this pandemic has pushed me to do. It's been amazing to see the lengths at which teachers have gone to connect with their colleagues or foster connections with families and students in some of the most innovative of ways. Administrators who have taken on so many new responsibilities to keep their teachers afloat. Students who have shown resilience through the most challenging of circumstances. This is the hope. And this has been and continues to be my inspiration. When the going gets tough, I'm the type of person that some might call a doer, meaning I don't like to sit and watch, but rather I feel a personal responsibility to do something. When I see a school community become engulfed in a darkness of mental and emotional strain, I feel the need to do something. And fortunately enough, I work in a place where the opportunities are endless. South Brunswick has been a place where I've been able to find passion, resilience, creativity, innovation, perseverance, and collaboration like no place else. Brainstorming sessions become realities. Requests for time are granted. District-wide initiatives are supported and celebrated. Constructive criticism isn't just welcomed, but is expected. Best practices we learn about in graduate school are actually on the table and put into effect. This is the culture that's been fostered in South Brunswick, and this is what I found to be inspiring during this great time of distress. During these months of remote learning, I've had the privilege to see paraprofessionals embrace online professional development with open arms and only a few qualms about technical difficulties. I've seen people take on additional responsibilities to build trainings, workshops, online resource hubs for the community, develop events, and prioritize social and emotional wellness above all else. I've seen administ administrators reach out, not for work, but to simply check in and offer a supportive hand. I've seen so many different teams come together to brainstorm, support, and encourage one another, from behavior specialists to child study teams to school crisis teams, the list goes on and on. And I've seen a community that has and continues to accomplish so much band together in the most heartfelt of ways. This is the hope within the struggle. I've had the privilege to do a variety of trainings, workshops, and focus groups around mental health over the past 10 months, which has been great not just because I've gotten to work with so many different people in the process, but also because these opportunities have forced me to go back to the books and remind myself what the research says is most effective during a global crisis like this. And a common theme has been one of acceptance. Now, acceptance can mean many different things across different contexts, but how I see it is this. There is so much about our current situation that we cannot control. However, when we're able to accept what is and stop fighting what isn't, then we give our minds a chance to look beyond the present into what hopefully can be in the future. In essence, acceptance can lead to hope and optimism. Dr. Monica Indart, a world-renowned professional in crisis response and trauma, calls this exact formula the core of resilience. This is the hope within the struggle, and it comes from ourselves and from one another. We accept what is within our control, and then we capitalize on it. It's not easy, it's not simple, but it's what we do. And I'm reinvigorated every day by each of you, and I thank all of you that I have had the pleasure to work with for opening your arms and expanding your minds to embrace what most would call impossible. Thank you and stay safe. Congrats to Brian. So you can see that our folks are sharing um, little shortened stories. It almost is like little TED Talks. And so without further ado, um, up next is, um, as you saw that Brian is in the K-5 world, up next is Rebecca High. Let me share my screen. 
Um, Rebecca has been with us since 2010, and um, she's part of the 612 world now. Rebecca's been with us, like I said, since 2010, is truly well respected and an invaluable part of the middle and high school programs. She also serves on the SEL committee, among other groups, and is always a champion for our most fragile kids. Rebecca also presented a virtual parent academy this fall. Um, hers was about stress management and self-regulation. I learned lots of good tips there. Um, so let's give a warm welcome and con congratulations uh, to Rebecca. Rebecca, I turn it over to you. When I was first told that I was chosen to be a keynote speaker this year, I immediately felt humbled and honored. Knowing the long list of well-respected and distinguished staff that have been given this honor, it only feels natural to have doubts about whether I'm worthy to be included in this list. The next emotion I felt was panic at the thought of having to give a speech, but just like everything else that's come my way over the last 10 months, I decided to put on my big girl pants and just try my best, so here we go. I feel like most speeches start off with some quote that sets the tone for what's to come or sums up what the theme of the speech will be. Once again, the panic set in as I tried to think of the perfect quote to summarize such a crazy year and how I've navigated it. Ultimately, my inspiration came from a quote on an old Marine Corps t-shirt in my drawer. The more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. Bear with me on this as I connect it to my journey. We were asked to talk about how we embrace the challenges that surrounded us due to COVID times. Specifically, my focus is mental health and wellness. And so while the last 10 months have come with no shortage of challenges, disappointments, fears, and bouts of anxiety I've never experienced before in my life, overall, I've done a pretty good job given the circumstances. And I credit my ability to handle all of the challenges and stressors that COVID triggered in my personal and professional life to the hard work I've put into developing sustainable, healthy habits over the last five plus years. Without even knowing it, I was building up my resilience. I was strengthening my physical, mental, and emotional wellness, and it's the strong foundation of daily habits that have carried me through everything these last 10 months of war have thrown my way. Now, please understand that's not to say I haven't struggled. I've had bad days just like everyone else. My family has faced some hardships. But I've learned to be grounded in gratitude and to focus on the things I can control and let go of the things I can't. And that letting go of the uncontrollable is no easy task for a type A personality like myself, but the toxic stress that comes with focusing on the uncontrollable is unbearable. All the trainings I've sat through, articles I've read, and videos I've watched related to mental health and COVID always come back to some basic themes that revolve around controlling what's in our control. And often they seem so trivial given the magnitude of the challenges we're facing. But in general, overall self-care revolves around these principles as well. Fuel your body with nutritious non-processed foods. Get regular exercise. Limit exposure to news, media, social media. Those are some of the main keys to handling stress. And when I embarked on my own personal healthy living journey five and a half years ago, these were all areas that I focused on. Another important area I started working on was personal development. And while that might seem like a no-brainer for me since I'm a psychologist, I can honestly tell you I didn't start incorporating personal development into my life until about five years ago. And talk about a game changer. I've probably read, and by read, I mean listen to on audibles in the car while I'm getting ready for work, while I'm driving to and from work, and while I'm doing chores around the house. But we'll, we'll say I've read about 30 books over the last five years that have helped me adopt a more positive outlook about the world and the control I have over my own happiness and mental well-being. And while embracing all of these concepts wasn't easy at first, because ultimately it challenged me to take responsibility over how I react to adversity, it has all led me up to this very place that I'm in right now. It's given me the ability to get up every day and not focus on the challenges, but instead focus on the controllable and appreciates the appreciate the blessings in my life. So the controllables I focus on in my life are daily exercise, which with anybody who's friends with me on social media knows that I get up at a ridiculous hour every day so I can work out before my kids wake up. Uh, trying to eat healthy, which is always a work in progress for me because I love all the treats, and morning gratitude. I consciously take time every single morning to thank God and the universe for my blessings in life. In March 2020, our lives were given a forced pause. 
all of a sudden everything was put on hold. For my family, that was a huge change. As we were so overscheduled, I could barely keep track of our calendar of activities. And while it was an adjustment at first and much fear and disappointment surrounded that pause, my family and I decided to embrace it and focus on the positives. And there has been no shortage of positives. Working from home has meant no commute for me, which means an extra hour of sleep every day, and man, has that been welcome. I spent more time with my children over these last 10 months than ever before, and that has been amazing for the most part. My mom guilt has lessened considerably because I'm able to be around my family more and not feel like I'm missing out on so much because there's not so much to miss out on. My husband used to travel for work more than 50% of the year, sometimes for up to three weeks at a time, but having him home these past 10 months has been incredible. Yes, we had stress from the six months he went without work, but we got creative with our finances and we were able to survive. Now for every positive I just listed, I can easily name a negative that goes along with it, but I'm not going to because I don't focus on the negatives. I acknowledge them and then I let them go and I find the positive. So maybe I spoke too soon. Maybe I will tell you some of the negatives as I shift my focus from my personal life to my professional life. For those of you that don't know me, this is my 15th year working in the schools. I spent the first 13 years of my career working as a school psychologist on the child study team. Last year, I switched positions and became a behavior specialist, which was actually a big step out of my comfort zone. I went from working at SBHS for 10 years to being spread across three buildings, North, South, and SBHS. Anyone who has changed buildings knows there's a learning curve when you're in a new environment, and here I was trying to navigate two new environments, not to mention I haven't worked with middle schoolers in about 10 years. So how fitting that just as I'm starting to get a hang of this new position, we're hit with a global pandemic, and now we have to figure out how to do our jobs remotely. And I'll be honest with you, I feel like I was just figuring out how to do my job in person. And since I'm just about to run out of my allotted time to speak, I'm going to try to sum up the most important things I've learned at work during this pandemic, which are the need to be flexible and meet kids and families where they are. This pandemic has affected our students in so many varying ways. I've seen students I work with who struggled immensely when in person at school flourish on remote instruction once the distractions of peers and temptations to engage in inappropriate behavior were removed. I've also seen students who are starting to improve their functioning in person take a major downward spiral once we've moved to remote instruction. The biggest challenge for me has been lack of access to some students. I'm used to hunting kids down and getting them in a room with me. If I can do that, I can usually form a connection with them and start working on some progress. Remote instruction constantly challenges me to find new ways to help kids and families. And I hate that there are just some situations right now where I don't know how to help. So I just try to remind myself that this pandemic won't last forever. And when the dust settles and I'm able to meet those kids face to face, I will do what I've always done, which is meet them wherever they are in their functioning and then try my best to work hand in hand with them to take steps forward. Because at the end of the day, that's all that we can do. So once again, I thank district administration for choosing me to be a keynote speaker today. And I offer myself up to all of you, my colleagues. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me if there's any way that I can help you professionally or personally as we navigate these tough times. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Awesome to hear from you and your message. We're now gonna switch um, to our keynoters under the topic of remote teaching. And um, first we're going to start in the elementary world. We congratulate Patty Del Gershio. Um, Patty is a first grade teacher at Indian Fields in Dayton School. She joined our SB ranks back in 1999 and Patty teaches with her heart. She's beloved by her students and so many and like so many of you um, had to pivot and reinvent herself during, co during COVID. Uh, I can't wait to hear her message. So let's give a, a warm welcome and congratulations to Patty. I'm truly humbled to be speaking to you today. I'm not sure that my story is all that interesting. I have been asked to share my experiences teaching during the pandemic. After thinking about it, I can tell you that I've learned a few things over the past nine or 10 months. Let me start, however, by giving you a little background. There are some things that every first grade student I have ever taught and their parents could tell you about me. First of all, they know that I have an amazing family that includes my husband, Joe, and two children, Ryan and Brooke. 
My students also know that I'm an avid sports fan and I root for the Chicago Cubs and the Las Vegas Raiders. The first graders know about my love for George Clooney. George owes me. I've cultivated a whole new generation of Clooney fans. The kids also know that I almost always have a cat or two. My current furry friends are Luna and Clooney. You guessed it, named after George. Maybe the most important thing my young friends know about me is technology is not my friend. If we were all sitting at the high school today, I would ask all of my colleagues from Indian Fields to stand. I would then ask them to remain standing if they have ever helped me with a technology problem, let me vent about my frustration with technology, help me figure out what wires go to which dongle, <coughs> or help me move a computer, a printer, or computer furniture. Every person who works with me at Indian Fields would probably still be standing. Thank you for all your help and patience with me. I have reached out to my children, my neighbor's children, experienced teachers, new teachers, teachers in other buildings, teachers in other districts, and teachers in other states for help. I'm grateful to each one of you, and you too know that technology is not my friend. By June of 2019, when Indian Fields learned that Peter Routine was going to be principal of our school, the word on the street was, Peter is a good guy and he loves technology. That was not such good news for me. When I first met him, we were at a getting to know you meeting. He asked me to share my thoughts about his new school. For the first time ever, I used the notes app on my phone to list my ideas. I figured he might think I was tech savvy. Peter now knows that technology is not my friend. When the pandemic hit and I was really going to be teaching from home, I knew I had to do something. My husband shared a video that he got from his job that talked about Zoom. I watched it and felt fairly confident that I could handle the basics. I also knew that my tech savvy daughter was right in the house with me in case of an emergency. It took me a very long time to get myself situated, set up and ready to run the meeting. But the first day went well. I showed the students how to turn on their mics and more importantly, how to turn off their mics. We had our meeting, it worked, but I wasn't fooled because I know that technology is not my friend. As we all know, most fears or dislikes are based on personal experiences. I'd like to share some of mine. During the initial stage of remote learning, I set up three Zoom meetings at three different times for reading groups. After those meetings, I had a break. One day I ran to the store to get a few things, probably Excedrin migraine, to help me cope with the numerous headaches I'd been getting. While I was out, my daughter sent me a cute picture of my adorable new kitten who was sleeping on my open laptop. I got home with an hour to spare before my Zoom class. Because I fear technology, I immediately sat down at my computer to make sure I could get my meeting set up. I jiggled my mouse, clicked on my Zoom icon, and was stunned to see that the writing on my computer was in Japanese. I did not know what to do. My sister speaks Japanese. I called her for help, but as my luck would have it, she didn't answer her phone. I asked my husband for help. He laughed. Everything was in Japanese, including the settings. I was panicked. I yelled for my daughter who always knows what to do. She came downstairs, looked at my computer and brilliantly observed, mom, this is in Japanese. Wow, I thought, thanks for the newsflash. She continued, I don't speak Japanese. You have to figure it out. I wanted to scream at her. Instead, as she walked away, I burst into tears. I just started pushing all kinds of buttons. Some were about languages and I eventually hit the right combination. With three minutes to spare, my screen was in English again. Now I was relieved, but if it ever happens again, I still don't know how to fix it. That's the type of thing that happens to me because technology is not my friend. Another time, the same cat sat on my computer as soon as I noticed, I shooed her away. I didn't think anything of it. 15 minutes before my Zoom meeting was scheduled to begin, I went to my computer and pulled up Zoom. As soon as I touched my mouse, a disemboweled voice said, you are hovering over the Z key. In case I couldn't hear it, it was also written across the bottom of my computer. 
Every time I moved my mouse, I heard that same voice and saw the same writing across the bottom of my screen. Now, with 10 minutes until I needed to let my students in, I yelled for Brooke. I told her I had a problem. Before even looking at the screen, she said, yeah, you do. You need to close the laptop when you're not using it. She proceeded to examine the screen, pull out her phone, and Google how to fix the problem. She taught me how to ask Google for help. The reason I have to ask for help is technology is not my friend. Teaching remotely has allowed me to see and hear things that I could never have imagined. For instance, one day during reading groups, a student's dad walked out of his bedroom in his underwear. Another family had a beeping fire alarm. It beeped from March until June. It may still be beeping. It was so loud that my family thought it was our alarm. My husband was going nuts trying to figure out where the noise was coming from. Again, technology is not my friend. In all seriousness, I have learned a lot about technology. I can certainly do more than I ever thought I could. My toggling skills have improved. I have a Google Classroom account, a Seesaw account, and have recently started dabbling in Padlet. I can even use Edmentum in spite of the fact that I have to reach out to their help desk every two weeks to get my account reset. Again, technology is not my friend. I still, however, often need help, and that is a lesson I have had to learn. I have never been a person who easily asks for help, but do you know what? It's okay to do just that. We all aren't experts at everything. It really is okay to ask for help. I hope newer teachers learn this lesson earlier in their careers. Asking questions allows us to grow. I should have asked a lot more questions. If I had, maybe technology would be my friend. A second valuable lesson I have learned over the course of the pandemic is that you can teach an old dog new tricks. I have been my own worst enemy. I'm too hard on myself. I have learned that I need to be more willing to learn new things, to take things slow, and to find time to practice. It's okay to not know everything, and it's okay to go out of your comfort zone, even if your audience includes first graders and their curious parents. But do you know what? Parents have been helpful and kind. They've been encouraging and supportive. Maybe though, while technology may not be my friend, it has started to be an acquaintance with whom I have to spend more time. You know, like the family friend that you had to spend time with as a kid, someone you may not have liked, but you tolerated. That's what technology has become to me. Maybe with a little more work, technology can become my friend. Thank you. Patty, your story was so inspirational and I know that so many people can relate. We're now going to move on to remote teaching and the middle school. And we congratulate and welcome Patricia Metzger. And I share a little bit about, um, about Trisha. Um, Trisha is joined our staff in 2001 and is a social studies teacher over at Crossroads North. Um, she challenges and inspires her students every single day. She's a great collaborator amongst her colleagues and has truly used this time um, for it to be an opportunity and not an obstacle. So let's give a warm welcome and a congratulations to you, Trisha. Can't wait to listen to your story. Hello, my name is Trisha Metzger and I have been a social studies teacher at Crossroads for 20 amazing years. Crossroads is exactly where I want to be, even when it's teaching virtually. However, I am not sure if you had asked me about remote teaching in March or even more in September, if I would have responded so positively. Everything I have loved about teaching has always been about being with people. Not teaching from my building has created a huge void in my day-to-day -day life. When we went remote, I wondered if I would be able to be a good teacher without being able to see my students. I miss the support and camaraderie of my colleagues. The eighth grade hall is truly a school version of the office. 
And I want to be there with everyone again. In September, I braced for a difficult year, missing my confidence and confidants and advisors and not sure how to start. I felt like a new teacher, except I wasn't. I have a lot of life experience and a lot of experience with middle school students. I have learned that just when you think you have written your story, the plot changes. All you can do is revise your story, keep evolving. I grew up with parents who instilled in my psyche the idea that every day is an opportunity. And the longer I live, the more I understand what that means. Every morning until I went away to college, my father would wake me up with an enthusiastic knock on my door and a call of another day of opportunity is at hand. Let us be up and doing. The underlying message, do your best, your best. You may not be the best at everything, but try. You can do it. Keep moving. There's always more to do. So I approached remote learning with this belief leading my way. I took everything I had learned over the years about how to be an effective, responsive teacher and worked at how to find those elements in the remote classroom. Opportunity, a set of circumstances that makes it possible to do something. Whether I liked it or not, I now have the motive to pull together all that was available to me so I could learn to teach remotely. At the start, I knew how to use Google Classroom, thank God. For years, our district's PD had focused on using technology in the classroom. So I dug out of my archives, my notes on the flipped classroom, apps and websites that can make learning happen. I also knew who presented those workshops and how to find them, and I did, and they were there. I did have a little bit of experience using that PD. Kyle Nemus, best tech coach ever, had created the choice boards that I was to use again and again in the spring. Jen Fava helped me create my first HyperDoc, and I still had that copy. Check. I had a partner. Craig Botnick, who lets me think out loud and brainstorm, and when he thinks I'm ready, helps me focus my thoughts into a real lesson. I have made progress. I set a goal that by June, I would be competent in using technology to meet the academic and social needs of my students. I make sure to check in with them, asking for help and for feedback, they are helpful and they are kind. I hope they see better, see better now that feedback on their work can be an opportunity for growth, that learning is a lifelong process and it's responsive. As the months have passed, I have been able to blend together good practices from in-person learning with the strategies I now use. Discovering the online tools like Jamboard and Padlet they can make class participation easy for students, allowing for all students to share and collaborate instead of one student talking at time or leading the way. Edpuzzle offers students the chance to work at their own pace and formulate their own understanding while being accountable. Poll Everywhere is a great way to close out and check for understanding. Kids love seeing how their points of view compare to others, particularly when it's anonymous. Having technology, gives me more ways to reach individuals. I can't see students' body language, but I can monitor their docs in live time to see their thoughts and answers. I can give feedback on that doc as the learning is happening. Even better will be when this is integrated with all the benefits of in-person learning. As for keeping in touch with my colleagues daily, we have very long text threads sharing concerns, reaching out to each other for advice and giving reassurance. I appreciate that our unit teachers were kept together for another year. It helps to know each other and have established relationships. Our Zoom meetings are satisfying. And while my unit mates might want me to be briefer, I'm secretly hoping each meeting will last a few more minutes. I love seeing them and hearing them.
While teaching remotely has been exhausting, I have become excited by the opportunities this year has offered. Without the need for online school, we might not have modernized our education system so quickly. All our students now have devices. They are learning to navigate and participate in the virtual world, one in which they need to be experts. I still worry about the students who are struggling during this time. I will continue to search for ways to reach them. One of my mentors when I first started teaching, Pat Yost said to me, this may be my 25th year of teaching, but this is their only year in eighth grade. Remember that it's our job to make it the best it can be. We need to seize the opportunities that we have. I want to believe that this year is valuable for all of our students. If it's not best, maybe it can be enough. Let's continue to look for silver linings and make the most of what has been a very difficult year. Let's keep moving forward together. So amazing to listen to Trisha, right? Uh, now we move on to our last but not least uh, keynote speaker. Before I introduce her, I do want to mention, as in our past tradition, um, each one of our presenters today will receive that coveted apple. Um, <clears throat> looks like the Tiffany Glass apple. Um, they all will receive one um, brought to them uh, to their schools as a, as a warm thank you and remembrance of this really special day for them. So like I said, without further ado, our last speaker today is on remote teaching from the high school. It's Ms. Meryl Orlando. Meryl's a family and consumer science teacher um, who has been in the district since 2004. She cares about each one of her students. And besides being a family and consumer science teacher, she also advises different clubs, including the Wish Club. Meryl is the brain behind the mental health and wellness fair at SBHS, which has been successful for so many years. Um, she too has embraced this pandemic and it's helped her. Um, she's helped to make her program be possible and continue. She's going to share that story with you now. So again, let's give a warm welcome. You're sitting back watching. Let's, let's give some hand claps to um, Meryl. Um, I turn it over to you. Thanks. Hello everyone, my name is Meryl Orlando. I'm thrilled to be one of this year's keynote speakers. I thank you so very much for this wonderful honor. I'm more than appreciative and I share it with all my colleagues who've given their hearts and their souls to make sure that our students are not only surviving but are thriving during this time. I'm sure that you've all heard the expression where there's a will, there's a way. I consider this one of my mantras. I don't know when I began to live my life this way but it absolutely guides all of my actions toward achieving my goals. I've been teaching at South Brunswick High School since 2004 as a family consumer sciences teacher. I began teaching only foods classes and then in 2006, I was given the opportunity to be one of the teachers in our Little Vikings program, which is now 40 years old. I was thrilled to be able to do that as I had taught preschoolers in daycare settings prior to having my children. Each year we have registered AM session and PM sessions of children, about 16 in each session. Um, and those, these sessions are part of our lab portion of our child development classes. When COVID hit in March, my former and now retired colleague, Janice Majorano and I moved our classes to a virtual setting. We met with children in our classes twice a week and we managed to make it successfully to June. In late July, I got a preliminary roster of my high school classes because I was now the only child development teacher instead of my usual 75 plus high school students who were always part of a four overlay level kind of class. I was now going to have almost 120 students, about 30 in a class. Having already conducted Little Vikings in the spring, I was armed with the knowledge that it would be unmanageable to conduct preschool classes where we would have anywhere from 42 to 46 people on the screen. It became obvious to me that I needed to reinvent Little Vikings. I had 120 students who'd signed up to take this class and who wanted to work with children. 
abandoning this program was not an option. And even though I knew it would look very different than what we thought it would, I was determined to keep the program running. From a community perspective, we had several hundreds of preschoolers and their families over the years, and we built a great reputation and I wasn't going to let that dissolve. Once we were given the official word about our remote learning plans in August, I sat down and worked with my high school schedule and the numbers to come up with a Little Vikings program that was no longer limited to 14 to 16 preschoolers. And because my high school numbers were so high, I thought it would be best to divide the class into two groups. My students might have less screen time, but they would have the opportunity for more direct instruction when they were with the kids. Each high school student would still work with a little preschooler, we call them little buddies, and they'd share that with another high school student. Um, my middle and advanced level students would plan two weeks worth of lessons on planning days, and I would move back and forth between that group and my introductory level students who were working on their assignments related to their curriculum. That all sounded good, but there was only one problem. I had no customers. Normally, we'd enroll our next year's preschoolers the previous March. As we all know, our last day of instruction was March 10th that year, last year. And we had scheduled our Little Vikings program registration for this year on, you guessed it, March 11th. So I had to be creative. I wrote an advertisement for the program and anxiously waited for permission for the program to take place and for this advertisement to be disseminated to the South Brunswick community. I got permission the last week of August. I really had no idea how many responses I would receive, but hoped for two classes worth of preschoolers, about 24 kids. You know that expression, be careful what you wish for? Well, by lunch on the day the notice went out, I had gotten over 50 responses. Within two days, I received over 125 emails to respond to. I now had a different problem. Again, my mantra guiding me. I reworked the plan so that each of our four classes would have their own set of preschoolers. We wound up with four manageable classes of preschoolers with 12 in each and 48 children in total. We began with my original idea of planning two weeks worth of classes in one planning session day and quickly had to revise that plan once we had a couple of weeks under our belt. I learned that it really didn't work to plan more than two days worth of classes. My students now plan two days of classes, they conduct those classes, and then they meet again for another two days worth of classes. The timing has remained the same, but as the weeks have gone by, I've reworked our daily schedule to adapt to what I've observed and learned. Along with the goal of providing a normal, but condensed preschool class filled with activities like the weather and the calendar and daily stories and fine motor arts and crafts activities, gross motor activities and math and science and social studies. And of course, snack time. We have sign language with Mrs. Gartland and a letter of the day object hunt that not only reinforces the letter's sound, but also gives the children another opportunity to get up and move. And speaking of normal, I knew that given the situation and the state guidelines, we'd never have in-person preschool this year. Both my high school students and the preschoolers would be missing out on that important component. And I was determined to create at least one in-person event. So on Halloween, we had about 40 of my high school students lined up on the sidewalk in front of the school dressed in costume, waving and cheering on the preschoolers as they drove by with their parents. We were able to give them supply kits and goodie bags and everyone was thrilled to be able to see each other. I really wanted to make sure that we were providing the best possible experience for the preschoolers. So a couple of weeks into the program, I sent a feedback form to the preschool parents. I've used their responses to help shape the program and I continue to seek feedback from them. And speaking of the preschool parents, corresponding with all 48 of them every week to give them a materials list and to answer questions is now one of my added duties. They've been very supportive and from all accounts, they really are very pleased with our program. They have to remain with their children to help them with muting and unmuting, to assist them with some of the activities and they help 
them join the breakout rooms that I move them and the high schoolers in and out of several times during each class. Our preschoolers are enjoying and learning in their classes with us, and we are learning from and enjoying being with them. The road to get here has not always been smooth. Some of the bumps seemed insurmountable and were incredibly frustrating, but keeping my eyes on the goal and not giving up and maintaining a desire to make this program work for everyone drove me to make delicious lemonade out of the lemons we've been given. Thank you, Meryl. Awesome job, awesome story. There you have it, everybody. You just heard from six of our um, folks, our family, um, hearing their story. And, um, you know, if we were in true SB fashion in, in person, you'd all be able to go up to these people, give them hugs, and congratulate them in person. A little bit, it's a little bit different today, um, but we have created an outlet, a way for you to be able to send your well wishes. Um, you can send any of these amazing people a well wish through a site called Kudo Board, which is awesome. I love sending kudos and I love that it's called Kudo Board. I will follow up this evening with an email to the district um, giving you links to each one of their Kudo Board so that you can um, let them know that you inspired them, um, connect with what their story was. And um, so even though we're not in person, you can really give those virtual hugs and words of congratulations. I really thank everybody involved um, with this program for helping us to keep our South Brunswick tradition intact. Shout out to Tim Sweeney for putting this whole video together for us. And I just thank you all for really finding the silver lining in this crazy pandemic time. Um, to Eve, Brian, Rebecca, Patty, Trisha, and Meryl, thank you for inspiring us with your stories and lessons learned. Um, there truly is so much to celebrate. So that's all for now. Um, I thank you all and take good care.